All right, so welcome everyone. We're uh, today's workshop is on market research. Um, as most of the other workshops I've done, we kind of follow a similar kind of format. Uh, so we're going to start off with some fundamentals. Um, I'm also going to talk to you guys today about product design, which is maybe encroaching a little bit on one of the next uh, uh, workshops that you're going to have, but it, it all ties in. Um, don't worry about that. Uh, then we'll get into market research specifically itself. Um, and then generally speaking, for most of these workshops, I like to try and give you guys uh, a bunch of insight that I've learned from my own experience, but are generally things that you're not going to hear from the majority of other people because uh, they're going to probably stick to typical formats, but I like to usually go off the map a little bit. Uh, so we're going to do that. And then we're going to finish off with a little activity at the end, uh, just to help make sure that we, uh, we learned what we could. Okay, so um, looking for a little bit of audience participation here, um, or you can type it into the chat if you prefer. Um, but if you could describe what a product is, uh, can you guys just give me a quick, simple answer? Of what do you think is a product? If you could describe it in a couple terms or less. All right, brings brings value, uh, tangible or intangible object developed by a company, addresses a need, something a consumer buys to use in some way. Yeah, I mean, I think you guys are all on the right track. Um, my simple answer is it's a solution to a problem, right? And that's the reason I want to describe it like that. Uh, we're going to see in a few minutes because uh, this is this is how we think about design as well. Um, and and so for those of you that think that market research is more of a business aspect or is non-technical, I can tell you for a fact it is very technical. Uh, and we're going to scratch the surface today, uh, but. As an engineer working on a, a design team, you're going to have to understand the market research that has been done. Uh, if not, be, be very much integrated into the team that is working on that because you are going to help them basically either design the product, which ends up being the solution to the problem that you're trying to solve. Right. So. Um, we're going to start off with one quick trap right here, because this is something that I've seen um, work in the consulting field. We, I've worked with like hundreds of startups, uh, seeing them from either stages where they're almost complete of their product, but a lot of them are just in like the concept or ideation kind of phase. And so that's why I wanted to relate that to you guys as well, uh, because this is something that I've seen a lot of times. And you'd be surprised how many companies are there out there that are not solving real problems. They and yet somehow, I mean, funny enough, they've been given money. So there's a lot of investors out there or VCs that are still willing to fund projects or ideas that aren't necessarily solving real problems. And there's a whole bunch of reasons for that. But the idea here is we want to try and solve a real problem if we can, right? I mean, obviously, if someone's going to pay you to solve something that's not real, you're probably going to take the money anyway. But um, the answer, so this is kind of a rhetorical question, OK? Are you sure it's a real problem and how can you figure that out? Well, the answer is today's workshop, right? Market research obviously is gonna help you to dig into that and figure out what uh, figure out what's um, what's actually going on and whether you have a real problem that's worth investing your time in. Um, and I'm pointing out here that there is a, a concept of explicit versus implicit. Uh, and we'll talk about a little bit about that uh, more in, in a few minutes. Um, so first, um, I just want to touch on a few quick product design concepts. Um, if you haven't thought about these things yet, uh, you're about to um, as you're going through your, your projects with your teams. Um, the first step, obviously, is you want to define the problem space. Um, so what is the problem and who is your customer? If you don't have a clearly defined problem space or a clearly defined customer, it can be very difficult to design something or work on an implementation. Uh, I've seen a lot of companies that ha have products and on the surface, they sound like they're great ideas. And then you start digging into it and you realize, well, I'm not actually sure what it does or why this is a problem or who the customer is that's actually going to buy this product. Um, so obviously you guys are just working on projects that are probably just going to maybe get to the prototype phase, maybe not even get beyond that. But um, just being able to think about it like this is going to help you in um, at least not even just this project, but in future projects where you're working on design or on a product, because this is the kind of mindset you want to have when you're thinking uh, thinking through product design. Um, as you're going forward with that, you're going to need to worry about um, the requirements and the features. So basically, what does your product need, need to operate, exist, or function? 
right? And that's simply what the features of the product are, right? Um, how does it work? That's what we call the use cases. Uh, how does it actually operate or function? Um, that can happen on many levels from the user perspective down to the app level perspective or interactions between APIs or libraries that you're using. Those are all can be can all be considered use cases. Um, you guys don't necessarily need to go into that level of depth, I'm assuming with your projects, but uh, again, this is just good information for you to understand of how real products are designed. Um, and then obviously there will be constraints or limiting factors of your product and especially in the project that you guys are working on now. Um, in the ideation phase, it's not a bad thing to try and dream big and think of all the possibilities and really dig in and figure out which space you want to be in. Um, but obviously with a, a time frame and a timeline that you guys are working on, you're going to have to constrain your project to some amount, right? Uh, you obviously don't want to be designing a full app if that's what your project idea is, uh, because that's a lot of time. Obviously, there are companies that have teams of experienced designers or engineers or, or people working on those products, um, and it takes them months, if not years, to design products, right? So obviously, you guys don't need to be designing to that level. But again, we just want to make sure that we understand how that works in, uh, for future reference. Um, so the next piece there that I'm just going to talk about briefly is, is system architecture. Um, this is a big concept, obviously, in, in engineering design. Um, so I'm going to show you a few examples of this here. Uh, you're not supposed to understand the majority of this, to be honest. I don't even understand the majority of it. I can talk to you at a, about it at a high level. But uh, the main point here is just when you're thinking of your products or your projects, you want to think about how are we going to put it together, right? Um, and we're going to get into why this is important in a second and how to actually do this very easily. So this diagram here is basically of some kind of hardware system that is showing you the, the basic different layers. So there's the application layer up at the top, and then there's a the hardware layer at the bottom, and then there's a lot of interface and other layers that happen in between. All these little blocks are connected to each other, obviously with arrows, um, and they do different things. Um, that's not defined clearly on this diagram, but there's a reason for that. Um, and obviously part of that reason is that it's super complex behind the scenes, and this is just a high level diagram. But these are definitely important, and I would highly recommend that you draw these out uh, for your own projects and your products, because this is going to help you to visualize it uh, a lot easier, and it'll hopefully reduce some complexity or effort that you're going to have to do. Um, and I'll show you why in a few seconds. So. Here's another um, uh, architecture diagram here. This is just a, um, some transport layer or networking um, data information on uh, the iPhone. Uh, this is uh, the Model 3, I believe, um, mechanical design. So question for you guys, and you can type it into the chat again. After seeing these system architecture examples, do you think that it's possible to explain or describe these complex systems in 10 seconds or less? And you can feel free to type in the chat, yes or no, or, or any other thoughts that you have. So, well, you obviously haven't watched my other workshops yet because this is obviously a trap. <laughs> Only a super technical person can. Uh, that's an interesting thought, uh, but I'm gonna give you a very easy way to do it. And every single one of you is gonna be able to do it um, basically right after this. So what I just showed you in all those diagrams is the exact same thing as what I'm showing on the screen right now. Every single one of those system architectures can be described as a, a black box, or in this case, a blue box, but we call that a black box with inputs and outputs. Every single system ever that you can think of can be described this way. Um, and this is important for you guys to understand because most people want to think that everything is super complex. So for example, your phone, there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes. I've worked at a number of companies that um, worked on products like that. And yes, there definitely is. But when you pick up your phone to make a call or to text somebody, do you think about all the hardware that is integrated and all the apps and all the code that was written behind the scenes? It's like, no, not really. All we think about is, OK, I, I know how to pick up my phone, and I know how to type. So input, text, output, send, done, right? That's essentially the system. 
And from our perspective, that's all we really need to know. Maybe it can be a little bit more complex where maybe there's two blocks connected to each other, right? With a number of inputs and maybe a number of outputs. But the bottom line is I still think of that the exact same as one large system where there's inputs and outputs, right? So again, the reason I'm showing you this is because if we go back to these, these diagrams, they look very complex, but it's Essentially, they're all blocks that are connected to each other, right? And there is something being passed between blocks generally, or they're performing some kind of function. But this diagram is a professional diagram made by some company, and they're using this to describe this to either other technical people, non-technical people, executives. Um, but they use this, and obviously, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on behind the scenes, but they don't necessarily talk about that. And that's fine. And that's what I want you guys to be able to take away from this is that when you're thinking about your products, there's going to be a lot of detail that's going to be creeping up. And especially as you get into some of the coding side of things and the more technical aspects, your in inclination is going to be to try and get to the complexity level quickly and to try and understand every nitty gritty little detail. But that's a big trap as well, uh, especially when you have a limited amount of time to work on thing. If I can treat most things in my design personally as a black box, I will, right? If I know that I'm just gonna plug my mouse into my laptop and I don't need to know how it works, but then I can use my mouse, that's what I'm gonna do, right? I'm not gonna worry about learning all the intricate details of the hardware and the communication interfaces and all the signals that are getting sent behind the scenes because I don't generally have time for that, right? So you need to be able to manage your time to figure out specifically what it is you need to learn so that you can describe something complex and something very simple in essentially a black box with inputs and outputs. All right. So hopefully that's sinking in um, and you guys are changing your answer from no to yes. Uh, if not, we'll, uh, we'll have to work a little bit on you some later as well. Okay, um, so some other aspects of product design that you guys are gonna be getting into, which I'm not really gonna to touch on, I'll just kind of go over them briefly right here. Um, obviously, we just kind of talked about defining the product, which is going through the problem space, defining the requirements, use cases, uh, and constraints. Um, and then I just showed you how to uh, define your system architecture uh, for any project. I mean, this can be a hardware related product, uh, software, or anything else as well. Um, you can always draw a diagram or a block diagram, and I would highly recommend that you guys do that to describe this, even for your presentations at the end of your product or, or projects. Um, having a nice block diagram that very cohesively describes your product uh, is gonna go a long way to be able to explain to the judges or the rest of the audience or whoever is there to look at your product. Uh, it's gonna go a long way to help them understand what you have, and especially if you're trying to sell them on this, which obviously if you're trying to win this competition, you want to do that. Uh, th the better they understand what you're doing, the better that's going to be for you, right? In terms of the actual implementation, uh, I'm not really going to talk about this because this is what you guys are hopefully going to dig into over the next couple of months, but um, things like component selection or actual detailed system design, finding APIs or libraries or things like that are, uh, I'm assuming are all things that you guys are going to need to do. I would hopefully expect that you guys are not digging into that too far because like we said, time is of the essence. Um, so again, if you have a nice block diagram, you could say, all right, well, we're gonna focus on this one block and we prototype this because we think that's the main proof uh, or concept that we wanna prove. Everything else is just plugging into that and maybe that's something else that's already known or that's nothing that we have to actually prove or, or actually design with a lot of effort. Um, so we're going to show you this one block. So again, that's back to the system architecture and making sure that you understand what your system is as a whole. And then you break off one piece of it and say, OK, this is what we're going to demo because this is the cool part or this is a part that we think is going to really wow you guys. And it's going to go a further or a longer way as opposed to trying to work on every single aspect of your design. Right. Um, Verification planning and uh, test validation. I'm not sure how far you guys have to go into that for each of your projects. Uh, maybe Eric can shed some light on that later, but um, I'm assuming that you probably don't have to go too far. So don't really worry too much about that. But in terms of product design, generally speaking, when we 
um, do it or develop a design for a company or for a customer as when I was in the consulting company, we'd have to think about what we were going to test and how we were going to test it up front. Because if we designed something that was not testable, then we're going to be in trouble, right? Um, and then obviously there's going to be a review and iteration stage, which again, I don't think you guys are going to have the opportunity to, to, to do right now, but who knows, maybe the ideas that you guys are coming up with are going to become um, uh, business ideas or ways for you to start a company down the road. So um, figuring out how to iterate on that and improve it time and time again is going to help you to get to that point. Okay, so uh, to get into today's topic here of market research, um, really what we want to think about is, is how are we going to move forward, right? Um, do we, how much research do we need to do? Uh, who is, who is our customer? So I'm putting up these uh, images here of three companies and we're going to relate back to these later on as well. Um, but basically my point of showing you this is let's say I have an idea for a food delivery app. I'm not necessarily going to be the first person to do this, right? I need to survey the market or look into the market and find out who's already doing this, right? Um, which other companies exist, what other ideas exist. Maybe someone's researched this themselves and they put it up on their GitHub as part of their uh, resume. Who knows? There's sorry, a whole bunch of ways that we can research or dig into a market to find out what's been done and what hasn't been done, right? Um, and I just want to show that there are companies obviously out there that you can be looking at um, to be comparing yourself to, right? So um, before we actually get into the interaction level research, which is kind of what I think you guys might be assuming market research is in terms of doing surveys or talking to customers or potential customers, um, the first thing we have to do is really ask some questions, right? So before we get to that interaction level of the research, um, we want to think about competitors, right? So obviously, unless we're thinking of something completely novel, which I'm going to talk about as well later, um, our assumption should be that there is a competitor in the market already, right? And if there are competitors, well, what features and use cases do those competitors have, right? What do those competitors do well? What do they not do well? Um, what do your customers care about? Are they happy? Um, how much money would they pay for improvements if they're unhappy, right? These are the kinds of questions that you want to be asking. Um, and if you ask that stuff or ask those questions now in the ideation phase or in the earlier phases of your market research, you're going to have a better idea of what you're looking for when you actually go ahead to do the research, right? The next step it generally is Googling. Um, and I could do an entire session just on Googling because uh, despite you guys being the generation of technology, I've found that a number of you do not know how to Google, which makes me laugh from time to time. But uh, obviously you guys are just uh, just learning and getting, uh, getting used to using the technology for design aspects. So uh, I'm not gonna blame you for it now, but uh, at the end of the day, when we're Googling, we gotta make sure that we're looking in the right places, right? I'm sure a number of you are familiar with uh, Stack Overflow or um, any of these places where you might be learning code. Um, that's a good place to start if you're looking for solutions to problems that you might have. But honestly, even when you're doing research, go to your competitors' websites. Right? Take a look at what they have, see what they're offering, see what they're pitching to their customers, uh, especially if you know that a company is doing well. Just uh, I mean, obviously you guys are in school still. So the, con the concept of copy and pasting is probably not gonna sit well with you because you've been told your probably your entire life that copy and pasting is bad or that you're gonna get in trouble if you copy off your friend's tests, uh, which is true, you will get in trouble for that. Um, but in the real world, we copy and paste all the time. Um, and I can tell you for a fact, especially in the hardware space, uh, when we're working on a design, we very rarely design electronic circuits from scratch. We only do it if we have to. The majority of time, even the vendor that we're buying a, a hardware chip from gives us a reference design to copy. And they tell us we would highly recommend that you copy this design because any deviation you go away from that design is going to Im uh, implement potential issues, which they're not going to be liable for. So 
all in all, the point is we want to be able to leverage and use what's out there. Um, and it's the same thing in Googling, right? We could come up with ideas on our own, which I'm sure a number of you guys have, but we can also Google some ideas, right? Um, and especially now with social media, there's a lot of people putting out a lot of ideas out there. So you got to just find it, right? So um, obviously there's that kind of stuff, which I think you guys are, or should be way better at than I am. Uh, I generally stay away from social media if I can handle it. Um, but research papers is maybe another area that I might be a little bit more familiar with, but uh, you guys can start digging into as well. There's a lot of information out there. Um, it might be difficult to read, uh, maybe at the level that you're at right now, but um, people have people have worked on a lot of different things in a lot of different areas. So it's definitely important to to be trying to find that information and not having to do everything from scratch. Now, the most important point that I just want to make here about Googling is uh, to actively Google the opposite of what you believe or whatever your thesis is. Um, this is, I mean, this is just a general life rule that I'm going to give to you guys because uh, this is one of the biggest problems I see with people's um, thought patterns. Uh, and I mean, hopefully you guys are not falling into these traps uh, as much, but let's just take politics, for example, people on the left side or the liberal side. Um, when they're Googling things, generally they get mostly information passed to them by Google and Facebook and these other places from the left wing point of view. And uh, people on the right wing get the right wing point of view. It's actually pretty difficult to find information on the other side unless you want to ask. Um, and if you ever find any friends or colleagues or, or parents or people that you know that are on the other side and you take a look at their Google search, you could type in the exact same Google uh, search as they have and you are going to get different results. It's kind of crazy when you start seeing it, but it makes you kind of realize that you're getting pushed a whole bunch of ideas that are uh, along with the same train of thought potentially as what you're already thinking, which can be helpful, but can also hurt you. And especially when we're doing market research, we want to be aware of that because if we're only getting ideas that we think are good, we might be missing the entire point, right? But we have to be very careful about that and just make sure that we are trying to ask the opposite. So sometimes I'll just invert my sentence or I'll say, okay, why is peanut butter good? The very next time I'll search, why is peanut butter not good, right? And hopefully I'll get some better results on either side and then I'll be able to come to some conclusions, right? Okay, so next step is uh, field research. Um, one of the things that is is uh, I find is helpful is to define a customer profile. So when you're looking at your, or thinking about what your product is, you have to try and think of who am I selling this to? right? Or who is going to be a user of this product? Generally speaking, I try and come up with a profile for what that person might be, either in terms of demographics, age, uh, their preferences, their interests. Uh, because again, if I'm designing a product for those people, I want to know how they think. I want to know what they're interested in. And I want to know what kind of things that they are, are relating for themselves and what their, what their tendencies might be. Next step might be to define a questionnaire. And ideally we wanna remove some bias or leading or loading of questions. Um, we're gonna go through an activity at the end where we try and figure out how to write a questionnaire in a good way. Um, but again, one of the things we wanna try and do is to identify our expected result. So if we think that something is going to happen um, from our question, we can then test it out, right? So this is basically like any science experiment that you've done in the past. You probably wrote, uh, had an idea of what the experiment was, and then you wrote a hypothesis of what you thought was going to happen, right? We're going to do the exact same thing here in, in field research or market research, because when we're asking questions, we don't want to just be blindly asking questions. Maybe the first couple of times we have no idea, but in general, um, I would that would hint to me that you haven't done uh, sufficient Googling because you should have some idea of what the market or what your customers might be looking for because you don't necessarily go into a conversation with a customer completely blind, right? Um, last point or uh, sorry, next point here is about listening to your customer. And I'm, when I'm saying listening, I mean like really listen to what they're saying. And I don't just mean what they are saying specifically or explicitly, I mean what they're also not saying, right? Now that would be kind of a tricky thing, um, but we'll, I'll give you some examples of that later. Um, and 
again, the question you want to ask yourself is, are you sure they are saying what you think they're saying? Which again, maybe is a confusing thing, but we'll go through some examples later. Um, after you get those results back, you want to analyze them and then update your customer profile. So this is kind of like that concept of iteration that we were talking about before. Um, we just want to make sure we're iterating or uh, updating our profiles with the new information that we're collecting. Okay, so uh, last point here is just about being critical in our thought and our analysis. So when we're listening to people, and this is again, related to our projects or our product designs, uh, but also these are just like general life rules that you can be listening about or thinking about as well. Um, people's choice in words can give you an indication of what they think, right? Um, same thing with their actions um, versus scenarios that might be conflicting. So they might say one thing and then their actions show you something completely different, right? Uh, I'm sure you guys have seen this before. Um, hopefully not too much in your friend groups, but in people around you, they'll say one thing and then they do another. Um, those are indications. And that's what we want to think about when we're doing market research, because we might ask a question and they're going to give us an answer that they think we want to hear, as opposed to the answer that they are actually doing or they're actually performing, right? Um, one thing to be very aware of is incentives, right? Um, especially when you're designing your product. I mean, if you paid me, to eat at a specific restaurant every day, I would eat at that restaurant every day, right? There are specific incentives that obviously are going to work. And most, a lot of people make decisions based on incentives, right? It's pretty rare that people work against themselves where they are working actively to not gain an incentive um, or work against an incentive. So that's just something to, to understand. Uh, and can't really get too much into that today, but um, that's just kind of a psychological aspect that you want to think about as well. And related to that, like I kind of just mentioned, monetary value. Um, so again, this is just something we want to think about when we're designing questions. If I ask somebody, okay, would you use this app? They'll say, sure. And then I ask them, okay, well, would you pay to use this app? Now they might give you a completely different answer. Right. So just because they say they want to use the app doesn't mean that it has true utility. Right. They might use it, but they don't necessarily need it. Right. If they needed it. They would probably pay for it. Right. So we have to may be able to make that distinction, especially when we're doing our research. OK, so um, like I mentioned before, I generally like to talk about some things that don't necessarily get explained um, or what I like to call traps. Uh, just because uh, when you Google market research, you're going to find a whole bunch of stuff online. Um, you probably could have done that before this uh, workshop, and you probably could have heard or found a lot of the information that I've already provided you. But I want to provide you guys with some insight that I've learned from my career, my experience, that you might not see on, uh, on those websites. Right. So we'll go through each one quickly. Um, Human psychology is a huge aspect of design um, and even engineering design. And this is not something that maybe technical people will talk about a lot, but um, I found this personally super interesting, especially when I started getting into it um, in terms of design is learning how people think and what they're interested in, because it turns out that's what they're actually gonna act based on as opposed to what their logic or what the logic might dictate based from a technical perspective. Um, now, the first point here is just about explicit versus implicit. I kind of already mentioned that, so I'm not going to talk too much about that, but I'm going to tie it into the second point, which is about posturing or this concept of virtue signaling, uh, which you may or may not be familiar with, but I would assume that your generation is more uh, in tune with these kinds of terms than my generation is, so I'm going to assume that you know what that is. Um, but if you're not, basically virtue signaling is trying to show off or show that you are doing things for valuable reasons, or basically you're signaling that you're a virtuous person, right? Um, so for example, if I told you that I was going to design a product that was going to solve climate change, I'm willing to bet that 90%, if not all of you are on board with it, right? Now, if I told you that that would, that product or that I was going to solve the climate change, but it's going to cost each of you a million dollars. Now we might be thinking twice about whether we are on board still, right? 
hopefully we are still on board, but again, maybe now it's a practical question. We can't actually say we're on board, but, but that's the point, right? So we wanna make sure that we are understanding what we're asking of our, of our customer or even from a psychological perspective. Uh, if we don't phrase things properly, we're not gonna get the true answer out of people, right? So do I care about climate change enough that I'm gonna forfeit or give up a million dollars for it? Personally, I don't know. Uh, if I had a million dollars, okay, maybe I'd be able to answer that question. But if I did, if I really believed in it, I might be willing to give you the million dollars before I got it, right? So anyway, that's probably going a little bit too deep into it. But again, uh, the main point there is, is price is king. So we want to think about how things are going to cost us. Um, and sorry, Bella says, if I had a million dollars, and yes, it would actually solve it. Sure. <laughs> okay, well, we have at least one virtuous person in this group. And yeah, okay. All right. Um, so I, I'm going to segue on to the next point here. Um, what should you do if you have zero competitors? So um, a number of you might be thinking that you've come up with an idea that is truly innovative, truly novel, and no one's ever come up with it before. And, and believe me, I've been there. I, I had some ideas uh, that I came up with that I thought were pure genius. I thought I was the only person that's ever thought of it. And then I typed something into Google and I found out very quickly that I was very clearly not the first person to think of this. I was maybe 10 years behind, right? Now, that's not a problem, but the point here is that you don't necessarily, I think we want to make sure that we are actually the first person to think of it as opposed to assuming that we are, right? So I've just kind of outlined some steps here uh, to help you figure out whether there are actually zero competitors or not, right? So step one, okay, why do you think you're actually the first to market, right? And if you are the first to market, there's probably some reasons for that. So that's something to think about, right? Um, and we really want to research this to try and figure out if this is, uh, if you're actually truly novel and whether you actually are first to market, right? Um, step three is strongly consider that a solution doesn't exist because the market actually doesn't value it, right? So you might have, you might not be the first person to think of it, um, but you might be the first person. And if you are, the question again leads back to the first points is, okay, well, why are you the first, right? And it might not be that you're actually the first, it might just be that the people that were ahead of you that also thought of it, realized that the market was not gonna be able to demand that that product exist, right? Meaning that the market would not pay or would not be able to support the idea that that solution should exist in the real world, right? Maybe that's true, maybe it's not true, but again, we should probably try and consider that first before we assume that we've come up with this idea where there's zero competitors and we're the first to market, right? After that, if we've gone through that research and we've figured that we've got to a certain point, let's summarize our analysis to try and validate or invalidate our thesis. And if all evidence actually suggests that you found this niche opportunity that is purely um, novel and you have zero competitors, you better move forward quickly. So. Maybe you're not, maybe only in grade nine or grade 10 or grade 11, and you're not in a position to be starting a company. That's fine, but start working on a side project. There's plenty of reasons to work on something on the side, throw it on your resume. It's going to look good for you. It'll help you to build. It'll help you to learn how to design something. It's going to give you all this practical experience. And if you actually are first in market, you should probably think about turning it into a company. And if you are going down that route, feel free to look me up after this because I know a lot of people in the VC space and a lot of other places and um, we can totally help you to uh, take that from wherever you have it right now, prototype or concept to actual idea and product. And maybe you can make that million dollars and solve climate change and everything will be good. Okay, so um, this is one that I like to talk about. I think I've mentioned it in other uh, workshops as well, uh, but it's just in terms of who you should trust. And the point or that I'm, that, yeah, basically the point I'm gonna try to make here is that there are very, very few people you should be trusting. Um, and especially when it comes to market research, we don't want to trust our customer, but we do need to listen to them. So when they're telling us something, either explicitly, explicitly or implicitly, we wanna make sure that we are taking their, um, taking their input and making sure that that's being, um, 
that we're incorporating incorporating that into our design but we don't necessarily want to trust what they're saying we want to just trust what their actions are showing us right so again this is digging deeper reading between the lines really understanding what the customer is trying to tell us because they might be trying to tell us something even though their words are virtue signaling or telling us something else right um don't trust the passionate passion is easily mistaken for knowledge and or truth um, and the beliefs where we're very passionate about can cloud our judgment, right? So we want to make sure that when somebody is giving us a very passionate plea for something or they're telling us that they really want this product, let's make sure that it's actual passion or maybe not even actual passion. Maybe it's based around logic or practicality um, because, again, I'm sure we're all passionate about changing the climate, but it's going to cost each of us a million dollars right now in debt or who's signing up first, right? So let's make sure that we are willing to put our money where our mouth is or we're, we're understanding where our incentives are gonna take us, right? Um, the last point here is just about uh, authority, right? So you don't necessarily have to trust your superiors. So someone who's older than you or arguably further along in their career or supposedly smarter than you or your parents or your teachers or your professors, whoever it is that are potentially in a position of superiority or authority, you don't have to trust them, right? And, or if you do want to trust them, make sure you're trusting them not because of their authority, but because of the logic of what they're actually telling you, right? Um, and this is a huge mistake just to take someone's word for it or listen to specifically what they're telling you uh, just because they're superior to you or they have some kind of level of authority. I have worked in a number of different places with a lot of very smart people, but I can tell you there are a lot of ideas that even those smart people had that they didn't necessarily make sense or they're not an expert in that area, but they still had ideas about it. Lots of people have lots of different ideas, yourselves included. Um, we shouldn't discount the fact that there are ideas, but we do need to validate them, right? So um, try to make sure that you're validating them based on logic or your analysis and not just purely taking the word for it just because they're in a position of power. And uh, the last point here is, is one that I've uh, basically told uh, to every student that I've ever worked with. Um, I've worked with a ton of co-op students that I've hired. Um, maybe that'll be you guys someday. Um, but one of the biggest things that I think holds people back, and I know it held me back, especially in high school or my younger years, uh, was a fear of failure. Um, and absolutely, it's easy to talk about and it's way harder to implement. But once you get past that, um, especially now, I mean, I can tell you from real experience as a, a, a day trader of electricity now, this is one of the biggest things that stops you from making money right if you're afraid to be wrong you stop putting on your trades and when you don't put in trades you don't make money right um and it's okay to be wrong and that's one thing that you have to learn um and i'm just outlining these in three simple statements here so first one don't be afraid to find out that your thesis is wrong uh you might have this product idea that you think is genius and then you talk to everybody in the market and they tell you that it's terrible it's like okay no problem Go back to the drawing board, figure something else out, right? Um, don't be afraid that you're not going to win the competition, all right? We want to try as hard as we can, obviously, but um, 90 or nine out of 10 groups are not going to win the competition, right? That's okay. Uh, the effort and experience that you're going to gain out of trying something um, with the opportunity to fail is what's going to help you to win in the future, right? Um, and this is one that actually... Um, held me back for quite a while and which is why I never used to ask a lot of questions in class, which I later realized was not allowing me to take advantage of the opportunities that I had in class. Uh, but I was afraid that people were going to think my ideas were stupid um, and therefore think that I am stupid, right? Um, it's a common problem, happens to a lot of people. I still get that tendency every now and again, but I have to like smack myself and, uh, to, to wake up and realize it's not that big a deal. Most of us are stupid. It's not that big a deal, right? Um, once we admit that that's the truth and we can actually not be afraid to ask questions that we might think are stupid, we start getting past those. And then next thing you know, your questions start sounding a lot smarter. So um, hopefully that's a little bit motivating for you guys uh, and hopefully we'll encourage you to participate in our activity now.
So we're going to go through a few questions um, to critique uh, how these questions are put together. So I think what a number of you might have thought market research specifically is, is going out into the market and specifically talking to people. Obviously, we've seen that there are a number of other steps that happen, like Googling and research uh, online or any other research in books uh, to, to figure out to, uh, initial information before you actually go and do your field research, right? Um, but the complexity of designing that questionnaire uh, when you go into the field is actually quite critical. Um, and we're going to go through a few examples right now. So um, if you guys would prefer to just type it into the chat, your answers, you can. Um, but if you'd like to just jump on your mic, um, now's an opportunity for you to sound stupid for me, uh, or I will sound stupid for you. No worries. Uh, but feel free to uh, jump on the mic if you'd rather just talk out loud like real people. All right. So um, in this scenario that I'm giving you, uh, I'm designing an app that is going to compete with Uber Eats, uh, Skip the Dishes, DoorDash, etc. All right. So the first question I'm going to do when I go into my field research is, I'm going to ask people, do you like to order food from a delivery app? Yes or no? Do you guys think that is a good question? Uh, or what, what are your thoughts about it? Should I start off that way? OK, one person thinks it's a good question. Anyone else? OK, so a couple answers there. Does anyone think it's not a good question? It's a bit too subjective. What does like mean? It's a good point. Agreed, there are definitely better questions. So um, I will suggest here that I think we could have asked this in a different way. So I think a better question is, how many times a week do you order food from a delivery app, right? And the reason I wanna ask it that way is because I'm going to be able to find out if they like to order from a delivery app by knowing if they order zero, one, two, or three times, right? Or, or three plus times, right? So. The idea is we want to be critical about the question as we design it because we don't want to have to be stuck with ambiguous answers, right? So if they said, yeah, we like to order from a delivery app, I never do it, but I would like, but I like to, right? That's a possibility, right? But if they ask me how many times and I say zero, well, it's okay. Well, then I'm probably not their target customer, right? So that's just about thinking from a critical perspective and understanding whether the question is uh, getting us the information that we want. Okay, second question here. Which of these food delivery apps have you heard of? Choose all that apply. Do we think this is a good question? Uh, okay, so if you have a better question, if you wanna type it in. Okay, so a couple of the suggestions have been, okay, have you ever used any of these apps? Uh, which app the apps most often. Uh, my issue with both of those answers is that they become relative, right? So which do I use most often? So I might use Uber Eats twice, DoorDash once, and skip the dishes zero times. But that's not a lot of times, right? When my first question was asking, how many times a week do you do it, right? So relatively speaking, I might be using one more than the other, but arguably I'm not using any of them, right? So uh, that doesn't really give me uh, the valuable information that I'm looking for, but what it does tell me um, or give me some insight is which apps do I use? Like straight up question, do I use Uber Eats yes or no, right? Because I'm not necessarily looking for the number of times because I've already asked them, how many times do you use your, your food delivery apps, right? So I already have that information. Now I want to use, now I want to know which ones they use. And why do I want to know that? Because when I know which apps they use, I'll know what features they're interested in, right? Or what a suggestion is of the features that they care about because who reads might have a set list of features versus DoorDash versus Skip the Dishes. And then I can now compare and say, all right, well, what does my app have or what does my solution have? that's gonna either be at least matching what they have or improving on their issues, right? Okay, third question here. What is more important to you for food delivery? Speed of delivery, convenience, ordering from multiple restaurants or food quality? What do you guys think about that question? If we word it differently, sure. Can you give us what the wording would be? 
a rating system. Yep. Yeah, exactly. That's, uh, that's exactly what I was thinking. So definitely it would be better if we were to rank them, right? Because again, if we're the keyword that we put in there was more, right? Um, I could have put what is most important to you because then at least that would give us the top pick, right? But maybe these ones are all just relative to each other, right? So we want to know all of them relative to each other if we're going to ask that question in the first place. So, uh, yeah, exactly. I think you guys are. I think you guys are getting on the right track. So, um, just going to show a few more questions here, but uh, we don't have to go through these. If you guys want to, we can. Um, but again, the the whole point of just going through this quick little exercise is just to make sure that we are um, being critical about the questions that we're making and we understand what kind of answer we're getting out of it, right? So if you think about what my responses were or my critique was of each of those questions, the idea was that we are going to try and go through it and understand what answer we're looking for. So again, if we go back to the first question, do I like to order food? Well, that's not really what I'm looking for. I wanna know how many times they order food because that actually gives me some real information as to whether I can trust their or validate their opinions because if they use it only zero times, but then they're telling me which of those qualities are important to them, well, I mean, those don't compute right? or those are kind of contradictory. So if I know that they order three plus times, they clearly care about their app. Therefore, I can take their information from the questionnaire more seriously, right? So again, that was the trust factor that we were kind of talking about earlier. All these things tie together, right? So um, yeah, so uh, that's pretty much where I want to leave it for today. Um, do you guys have any questions? Um, and feel free, if you want to jump on your mics now, we can talk about either specific questions you have about market research for your projects or anything in general, but we'll leave it open maybe for five minutes or 10 minutes or so. However, it depends on the questions or how many questions you guys have. Uh, before we wrap it up here uh, to close off the workshop.